Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of the Sports Tech All Stars podcast. I just got done with a really good chat with an old friend, Francis Casado. He is the head of business development and co-founder at ED Digital Venue, a company based out of Spain that does the mapping and digital twins for stadiums, venues, arenas, not just for sports, but all sorts of venues. A company that's been around for a while, uh, 12 plus years. So Francis has really seen the evolution of the space moving from, let's say, operating just uh, uh, around operational efficiencies that it can bring to now unlocking revenue opportunities. Cover that whole spectrum over the course of the episode. A really good one. Hope you enjoy it. All right, Francis, it has been a minute since we met. We were just talking about this before we jumped on. The last time we saw each other was in a very nice conference in Ibiza. So it's good to see you, my friend, once again. Welcome to the show. For people who don't know you, tell us about who you are, what you do at 3D Digital Venue. Okay, so uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you again and uh, you know to, to be able to share this opportunity together. So I'm, I'm Francis Casar, one of the founders of 3 Digital Venue, and what we do is we basically do venue meeting. We've been doing this for pretty much uh, 12 years, and uh, basically we are trying to resolve a couple of problems that are common in the industry. Okay, so one of the, the key problems is just uh, finding or trying to resolve the outdated and inefficient venue mapping solutions and the stagnant online ticket sales processes. Normally, what we try to do is tr we try to modernize and simplify venue mapping, making it more accessible and affordable for small and medium venues, and also enhancing the online ticket purchase flow to increase conversions and improve the event discovery for fans. And let me give you an example. A small or medium performing arts venue that we have here in Barcelona, Liceo. Every tourist that comes to town goes to Liceo to see an opera. When you go and try to buy a ticket for Liceo before they were implementing our technology, they were literally printing a ticket and giving it to the customer. And sometimes they were going up to the balcony and trying to follow the event and they didn't see anything. They were going down and complaining without noticing that on the reverse side of the ticketing, they had something printed that said, hey, there's no visibility. With our technology, they were able now to have at the box office and also online a tool where they can check each individual seat and understand if they are going to have visibility or what's what they are going to get for the price they pay. Yeah, makes sense. In fact, the important thing to catch is what you said right at the beginning, 12 years, right? Like you guys have been doing this for a while. And the reason I want to emphasize that is that digital twins or virtual environments have become quite a rage now, especially over the last two, three, four years. But you guys have been there for a long time. Uh, maybe walk me through that origin story a little bit. Like what made you want to tackle this problem? So, yeah, we, we started originally helping organizations that had, uh, let's say, challenges. We, we started with the remarkable names here in the Spanish industry, which is like uh, Athletic Club Bilbao, when they were building the, the new San Mames, they contacted us because they wanted to have like a digital twin to communicate to the fans how the new stadium would be. Because, you know, San Mames or Athletic Club Bilbao, they are a fan-based club. In other words, there's uh, something attached to the feelings and the sentiments and all that. So they had to communicate this very well. They had to promote it. And after that, they had to sell it to the customers without having the venue built. So they started working with us. We created an interactive version of Sorry, the stadium. Which, which year is this? Can you set a timeline? It's uh, 2012. Okay, was, yeah, so, uh, yeah. yeah, a while back. It's it's a while back. So, and, and you're right, that's that's a good point. Uh, 12 years ago, when we were building these, they were looking at us like Martians. Hey, why the hell do we need to have uh, a digital twin for these if we can just have some pictures or some renders? So we were providing a website where every season ticket holder was able to sit virtually at any seat of the venue or even at any premium space and understand how the venue would look like. And the most important thing is we were giving the sales guys a tool to make that happen. They were contacting or over the phone or they were inviting the season ticket holders to go to the stadium and they were showing those spaces on a bigger touchscreen 
and they were able to understand how the space would look like and why they were going to spend money in the new stadium. And I find that super interesting. So I'm going to stay on this topic for a while. 12 years ago, what made you and your and your founding team think that this was a good idea? Was this something in the market that you were seeing? I know you were operating in the 3D kind of space uh, okay. beforehand, which is what I want to bring out. So you had some experience in this area and you were translating it into, let's say, entertainment venues and sports venues. Yeah, absolutely. So our background comes from real estate. Actually, my co-founder and um, Michele Marino, acting as the CEO of the company, came from real estate. I was uh, doing, in my early days, developing mobile applications. And we said, hey, why don't we join forces and we try to create something that we can use for that particular environment? If we know how to recreate big environments, such neighborhoods, or even big facilities, why don't we try to apply this for venues? And originally, we thought it was a good idea because it, they look like smaller and simpler, but they are actually not because the venue is very complex and they change uh, year over year. They change the layout, they change the sponsors, they change the configuration depending on, the, on, on the, the, the type of events that they set up there. And right now, every venue is pursuing the idea of becoming a 365 venue. In other words, they want to host multiple events over the year they need to, you know, reorganize differently. Different promoters are coming to the venue and you, you need to have a versatile venue and also an organization that is able to adapt to any of those needs. And this is a scene in a lot of the newer stadiums that have uh, come out in the last maybe three, four, five years. The Tottenham Stadium mm -hmm. is a classic example where I remember somewhere in the pitch or let's say in those early days about when it was being talked publicly, they said something like, we want to be able to host the Tottenham Hotspurs on a Saturday or a Beyonce concert on a Sunday, do an NFL yeah. game on a Monday and a business conference on a Tuesday. Just, you know, really create a stadium which is so flexible, adaptable, based on the different environment. It, for that, it needs a hell of a lot of planning, which is where yeah. I think uh, a solution like yours comes in. You've said you've been around for a long time and there are a bunch of great logos on your website. Maybe walk me through some key use cases. You've already mentioned Athletic Bilbao, maybe some recent ones, or recent success stories that are close, close to the group. Yeah, we, we've been uh, lucky uh, to, to work with uh, different organizations. For instance, one of the most recent ones that I, I especially like is, is the O2 or Crypto.com Arena, two multipurpose arenas that are one in the UK and all one in the US. They normally host more than 150 events per year, which is something crazy if you think about it, because they are constantly changing the layouts. They are of uh, a machine of morphing and changing their layout from one event to another. And they had multiple challenges, as you, you mentioned before. One of the challenges, for instance, was how do we generate enough digital twin configurations to warranty that the clients are going to be happy? And how do you do that really fast? You know that one, one uh, for instance, a performer like Taylor Swift or Madonna or Harry Style goes on sale, normally they have hiding or they have been precluding the others to know how the uh, you know the stage layout is going to look like so you need to do it last minute and you need to be able to be flexible and offer that service practically on the fly so those organizations they have been uh, establishing or securing partnerships with us because we have that ability to go really fast and to provide that technology to them other ones you know, big sports facilities, so like FCB Barcelona or Real Madrid or recently New York City Football Club. They are building new stadiums and they have uh, put their confidence on us just to be able to create what they call their sales experience centers, which is like a space where they can promote the new stadium and obviously sell it to the people, inviting them on a personal environment because in the end it's a it's a cell that it's emotional. So you need to spend time with them. You need to convince them. But the most important thing is you need to generate trust. And this is something that you can only do with the combination of those tools, the digital twins and the personal attention that you need to bring to those customers. I'm talking about the use case. I mean, you rattled off a bunch of big names over there. So it's okay. great to see the traction that you guys have achieved in the last 12 years you've been around. I, I want to focus on what exactly is possible with a digital twin in terms of the service uh -huh. delivery. So you've talked about ticketing planning, maybe layout planning, understanding the space a bit more and stuff like that. 
But I also believe that there are revenue opportunities that you could be unlocking, right? Maybe there are experiences in stadium, virtual arenas and stuff like that. Is that something that you already operate in? Is that something that you're planning to do or that's uh-huh. not for you? Yeah, it's, that's a very good question because obviously there are the, the standard, let's say, challenges. Every time we're building a, a digital twin is obviously to anticipate revenue for the organization. So the fact that they have the digital twin warranties that they can go and they can start promoting or even selling the stadium months or sometimes even a couple of years before they open, it's been evolving into a thing that is more related to what do we do pre-event and what do we do post-event, even using those tools. So we are in conversation with certain organizations that are willing to create what we call the infinite stadium. Imagine using the digital twin to engage audiences from all over the world. Imagine for a club like, I don't know, FC Barcelona or Manchester City or Real Madrid that have global audiences. When you you are in town, you can attend the stadium and they have a capacity of 80,000 seats or 98,000 seats. But what if you could use the digital twin to start engaging with hundreds of thousands of users at the same time? You create several instances of the stadium and you let them sit virtually And you let them follow the event from a digital perspective. So we have started engaging with partners that are streaming or creating their own OTT just to promote those events into a virtual environment where you can engage with all that audience at once. And those audiences, they can interact with each other. So the guy that is on the physical event, he can chat with another one that is on the virtual event and engage and interact and have like you know, be part of the same experience. That's something that we have started doing. And obviously there are multiple things related to merchandise and, you know, all the aspects that have to do with virtual reality and augmented reality that go beyond the stadium, okay? Using all those tools just to create that feeling of belonging to something. And I think this is the important aspect to remember as the, it's kind of like almost a phase one was all the operational efficiency that you build in to delivering a digital twin of a stadium that there is so much more a sports organization can do. And as that matures, then you look at what else can we do? What else can we unlock? What are the revenue opportunities that we can create? And as the conversation around, let's say, digital assets, Uh whether it's digital merch, digital venues, digital worlds that we want to live in, um, and these sports experiences play a big role in yep. how, and, and and you see the value for the sports rights holder and also for the fan. It's a it's a nice win. Yeah. So how, how far along are you in this product or in this process? So we are currently in the stage of creating prototypes, uh, and the success so far is great. Uh, the let's say that we have been evolving quite nicely on how do we receive data and how do we represent that data on top of the digital twins. So the biggest challenges that we've faced over the years is the delay that you have, uh, for instance, when you receive that coming from the the pitch itself. Imagine that uh, there's a soccer match happening somewhere in the world and you need to receive that data in real time about the player positions, movements. What are they doing? Are they passing the ball? Are they shooting? Are are they just uh, running from here to there? So all that data needs to go to a cloud service and needs to be distributed across the globe. And then it needs to be represented on top of the digital twin to guarantee that you can follow the action. So that was the biggest challenge that we faced. And I believe we've been doing a great job just, uh, you know, receiving that data, processing that data and being able to represent it on top of the... Of the... Very cool. I want to switch track now to let's say the evolution of the company or the evolution of the market as well, because both of these are happening at the same time. You said 12 years ago, nobody was, people are looking at you like you're crazy, like you're Martians, no? When you're talking about the project with Athletic okay. Bilbao. How have you seen the evolution of the buyer, the sports entity, the sports rights holder? This, okay, it's not just always sports, right? In your case, it might be different types of venues. Are, are they, I would imagine, from compared to 12 years ago, they're more open. But how does that impact the buying process for you? Uh, is it much shorter? Is it like, hey, people know exactly what they wanted. They come in, boom, just take my money and give it to me. Or is this still uh, a process of education, of training, of teaching that, hey, this is what we can do for you. So it's almost like the market is, I'm trying to understand how mature the market is uh, for a service provider like yourself. 
It's it's a very good question because when uh, <laughs> as you said it's funny. Twelve years ago when we started selling these, everyone was saying, "Hey, why do I need that? I'm already selling. I'm, I have started selling online. What's the purpose of having a, a digital twin or creating widgets and tools that can be plugged to my ticketing platform?" So twelve years ago it was like a, a nice to have. As I said, we started in Spain and it was really challenging to convince any customers, especially the stakeholders that were wearing multiple hats in some cases for, for some organizations. So normally the ticketing guy, the marketing guy and the revenue guy, they were the same guy wearing multiple hats. So we decided to go to other countries. And in that regard, we left Spain, we went to the UK and we were able to convince certain organizations to start using our services like the Manchester City or Wembley Stadium or Liverpool Football Club, one of the most advanced clubs at that time. They were interested in our services because they saw that those tools were helping them to convert more or to convert faster. Neither Man City or Liverpool, they had problems to sell tickets, but they were trying to uh, convince or to convert their customer base into, uh, you know, people that were used to buy online. We were able to do this, but it was when we landed into the U.S., which was around 2016, when we understood that that process was evolving fast. In the U.S., there's a culture, or let's say there's a... Uh, alphabetization, if you wish, where everyone understands that mobile is the first entry to any content. Everyone is checking their mobile for content, even though they go and convert or they purchase on desktop or on other devices. That was in 2016. But at that time, we understood that that was the evolution that was coming to Europe. So we started partnering with local ticketing platforms and organizations in the U.S., and then we brought that trend or technology to Europe. And nowadays, and especially after the pandemic, we've seen a big chip. Everyone is consuming digitally. Everyone is used to have digital tickets on their wallets. And everyone is willing to have digital twins or interactive interfaces on their cell phones just to guarantee that they can buy faster and especially with confidence. And let me give you an example. Mm -hmm concert tours. If you go to Taylor Swift or Madonna or Harry Styles or Metallica and you're going to pay sometimes 1,000 euros or 2,000 euros for a particular seat, you want to make sure that you are going to be able to follow the action in a very nice spot and you're going to have services attached to these like food and beverage and something else. That offering is now reunited and offered as a single service in a mobile application. That has been changing over the years. In the past, it was like disconnected services. And right now, it's a reality that we can access at the palm of our hand. Yeah. And as the, let's say, end users' expectations are evolving, then uh -huh. the supplier also has to kind of feed that market, right? We're used to, as you said, everything being easy on our phone when we're at home, at work, whatever. But it's still annoying when it's not easy when you go into a stadium. You know, right. I, I have that experience so many times if I go to visit you go to watch a football game like it's you're not you don't feel connected even though you're in the physical space you don't feel connected to it it's i'm so used to interacting with my phone to make sure that it it can give me either more data about what's happening or to order something or it's if it's almost as if if the stadium or the venue can be digitally enabled it just makes mm -hmm. my life so much easier and such a better fan experience for me no no absolutely and and the demographics has all have also yep. changed you absolutely. know so yep. the pre-pandemic it was different but now I would say millennials or the new generations are attached to their phones and they go to the match and they use their phone during the match and they are even trying to upgrade their experience. So we've seen, for instance, in the U.S., especially after we signed a deal with the Major League Baseball, that uh, every single patron or customer is going to the stadium and if they see that there's a better seat, I don't know, yeah, 10 yeah. rows closer to the action, I'm happy to pay that difference even during the game even if it costs me 20 bucks or 30 bucks, I release my old seat, I go to the new seat, and I'm close to the action, or I'm even happy to pay for a premium experience so I can have access to a VIP space and buy food and buy, uh, you know, drinks and whatever. And these are the, the type of technologies that we have started offering blended with the digital twins and the customers have started consuming. And they demand, if you don't offer these, 
then you look like a second or third division uh, team, you know? So it's something that it has become a mainstream or a commodity, if you wish. I had uh, on this podcast, a company called Dibs, D-I-B-Z, uh, which is a uh-huh. US-based company, which basically does exactly what, what you just described. It's a ticketing solution, which allows you to upgrade your existing ticket once you're in venue. I thought it was super cool. I'm like, I can't wait to try this. In European football, we don't have the problem of empty stadiums too much. This is a bigger thing for uh, American, let's say, especially in baseball and maybe some basketball arenas. They don't fill out the arena so yep. well. But yeah, it would be super fun. Side note, I don't appreciate how many times you mentioned Manchester City and Liverpool in that conversation. As a United fan, it hurts me so much to see that my team is so <laughs> far behind when it comes to evolution and new development and innovation. But I think it's also worth mentioning that there is so much talk of a new stadium. In fact, just a couple of days ago, they were talking about a £2 billion stadium being, you know, planning projects and stuff being submitted. So there will be a new Old, old Trafford and it'd be great to see this 3D digital in there. Yeah, making it a better experience for me the next time I go back to, to that historic arena. No, no, that would be great. That would be great. And we're really looking forward to it. So Man United is also a, a great client of us and they have been spending a lot of time on this. That's in their premium experience because Fantastic. they understood that premium is, is something very relevant. And this is also a big shift after the pandemic as well. So now people understand that premium experience is everything for them. And especially millennials or people that are between 30 and 45 years old, now they go to premium spaces together with their friends just to have that experience rather than going to the seat themselves. So they go, they have food and drinks, and they follow the action while they are socializing and engaging with their, with their friends. We might have covered this already, and I think that we have in this conversation that we just had, but I want to ask you from your perspective, what are the biggest trends that you are keeping an eye out for in this entire, let's say, digitization of a uh, of a venue? You talked about premium experiences, you talked about enhancing the van experience, but maybe there is one or two specific things that you're like, no, this will definitely be a part of the future that I see. Yeah, so we, we are seeing, we call it innovations and uh, obviously AI is everywhere. So we have been developing our own AI-based algorithm just to be able to to help those venues operate differently, uh, leveraging existing data and models from previously digitized venues. In other words, we can generate venues using parametric algorithms, for instance. The objective is to offer a digital twin that can be used for anyone. And obviously, there are clubs that have money to spend, but there are others that uh, they, they don't have the same level of budgets. So with this extensive experience in digital modeling that we have, we have been creating those tools that we can uh, that helps us reduce in production times and costs, but also ensuring that every new project is going to benefit from those best practices and, and insights. So creating what we call geometry nodes, you can just literally build venues in a quarter of the time that uh, that we were spending just to do this and guaranteeing that, I don't know, every Broadway show in the U.S. is going to be able to use a digital twin or every minor league club is, is able to have a digital twin just to improve their conversions and just uh, communicate to their fan base uh, uh, properly. And obviously, AI is going to play a big role in, in that regard. Just allowing your solution to to reach more to more venues, no? Mm-hmm. That's super power. Yep. That's the power of scale yep. that will bring. Yep. Fantastic. All right, Francis, it's been it's been a good chat. We're we'll motoring through last couple of questions. First one is to let you tell us what is coming up for three D digital venue in the next 12, 18 months. You mentioned a little bit already in 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 the answer about the implementation of AI in your solution, but maybe other key projects that you want to talk about. Any fundraise? Are you hiring? Uh, any call to mm-hmm. action? So what's coming up? And maybe as a follow up, what is a, a call to action to any listeners and or viewers? Yes. Yeah, so as a company, we have been growing significantly over the last couple of years, and uh, I believe we're going to continue growing. So uh, the U.S. market has become very predominant for us, and we're trying to you know, just mimic or copy what we've been doing there in the European and even on the Asian market. Right now, we have launched a concept uh, that it's called the Venue Workspace. The Venue Workspace is a catalog of venue maps and seed views that uh, of our partners can utilize. So in other words, we have been modeling the, the world in Digital Twins for any venue that is on our list. Obviously, we create them based on the top uh, revenue generators that we detect from here and there. But now we have a catalog of more than uh, 12,000 venues available in our catalog that can be consumed and plugged to a ticketing platform with the intention of you know selling more, 
and convincing the customers. So that's one of the key uh, pieces that we're going to put in place and is going to be released uh, very, very soon. And yeah, we're going to continue growing and the idea is to, to go for more funds just to try to, to become more relevant in the industry, convert ourselves in this standard de facto, uh, you know, technology for any venue, website, or even ticketing platform. And with that, obviously, we're going to uh, we're gonna face certain challenges, like how do we grow the team? How do we internationalize and make sure that we have a stable team in the U.S.? Now, apart from the sales guy, everyone is, is here in Europe. So at some time, we, we would even think to flip the company and become a U.S.-based company with a Spanish the, uh, subsidiary that is developing and licensing the technology to them. And that's our purpose for the next 18 to 24 months. You're going to leave sunny Barcelona, Francis. Wow. You better pick a sunny spot in the U.S. I have to come and visit you guys. Exactly. Exactly. So that's it. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So basically, call to action is that they're opening a round at some point in time. So any investors listening or people who just want to know more, get in touch with Francis. What is the best place to reach you? Maybe LinkedIn or your email you want to share? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, they can contact us through LinkedIn, but if they want to reach out through email, it's, it is francis at 3ddigitalvenue.com. So happy to receive any connection. We're always open to, to entertain conversations. Super. We'll put all of Francis's links in the show notes. All right, Francis, again, always a pleasure to see you, my friend. Before I let you go, I have one last question to ask. It is my favorite one to do. I want to know what has been your favorite sporting moment. Okay. So I would say I have a few and they are quite mm -hmm. different. Go for it. So I, I was lucky enough to, to watch when Spain won the Euro, especially recently. Wow. But I was also I was also you, part you were in to... Berlin. No, 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 no. I ah. was watching it from home. I was watching ah, it from okay. home. But watching it with the family and all that, it was it was a really yeah. nice moment. So the I'm a big football fan and being able to to watch these and especially when when Spain won the World Cup a few a couple of uh, you know well, not a couple of uh, some some years ago it was I was very privileged and right now uh, if I bring it to the my personal life uh, we have a kid the kid is 14 years old he's been playing quite nicely uh, on his football experience as well and I've been lucky enough to see him winning two uh, league uh, trophies and what? right now as a parent I feel very proud and and I hope I can continue watching him and. And, you know, seeing how he progresses and perseveres the way he does. So these are my two, would say, a special sporting moments. What a lovely way to end. That's that. Now, that is a stadium experience, no? As a proud dad to see your, exactly. see your kid lifting a trophy. <laughs> That's a moment to be captured. Uh, fantastic, Francis. Always a pleasure to speak with you. I hope to see you soon. Maybe not in Ibiza or maybe in Ibiza, somewhere else. But I'm sure we'll, we'll see each other soon. And uh, keep us posted on all the, all the cool stuff that you get up to. Thank you for uh, for this interview, man. It's been great to reconnect with you and congratulations uh, for the podcast. Brilliant. That is a wrap for another episode on our series. We've, we've covered quite a few topics. We've gone from broadcast innovation. We've talked about 3D uh, venues or digital venues. It's been a fun one. We're going to go next month into the topic of sustainability because we believe that it's important as well. Last year, we talked about social inclusivity. For the summer, this year, we're going to focus on sustainability in sport. We've got a nice little lineup for you on that topic. Stay tuned. See you guys next week. Ciao. All right. Bang on 30 minutes. There cool. we go. Thanks for listening to the Sports Tech All-Stars podcast with Roan Maholtra. If you like our show, let us know and leave a review. And if you want to know more about us, check out sportstechx.com where you can find our latest industry reports and updates. For a deeper dive into all things sports tech, check out our comprehensive database, Sports Tech DB, at sportstechdb.com. Don't forget to follow us on social media. You can find us at Sports Tech X on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Join us next time for another insightful conversation with a leader in sports tech. <laughs>